A band of lost Vikings heads south for some good pillaging, converts to Islam, and teaches us all we need to know about the secrets of the runes. <laughs> you heard that right. Today, it's all the runes you can handle. First, learn what runes are and how the Norse used them. Then watch the Endless Knot to explore the history of the word rune and some surprising ways runes are still relevant to our own tongue. It's a double dose of runic content. On to our story. Spain, the early Middle Ages, the right kind of time and place for the Muslim conquest to drive out the ruling Goths, and then for the new ruler to turn around and declare Spain his own emirate. But it's also the right kind of time and place for some marauding Vikings. Here they come, sailing down the coast around 840. And what do Vikings do? Give me some words. They, uh, they raid, they pillage, they, uh, they sack. Yes, the Norsemen sacked Lisbon and then sailed up to Sevilla in 844. They attacked, they stirred up panic, and then they held out for weeks waiting for their ransom gold. When it did arrive, surprise, it wasn't gold. It was a Muslim army ready to crush the Vikings and burn their ships. Try again? Wait some decades, reinvade Seville, and get slaughtered by more Andalusian forces. Now, only Odin's ravens know what happens next, but the story goes that a small band of Vikings escaped, wandered around, and settled in southern Spain, where they converted to Islam and became the region's first cheesemakers. The Vikings themselves aren't the ones telling us this tale. No, we get tales of Viking raids from their victims who wrote in bookish scripts like Arabic and Latin. In Arabic, they didn't even know what to call them, so Vikings were magus, magi, Zoroastrians. <laughs> the magus weren't just pillaging Spain. They hit England and Scotland 50 years earlier. They stormed Normandy and Paris. They sacked Liguria and Pisa founded Rus in the east, so they're even to thank for Russia and Ukraine. They threatened Constantinople, were hired to guard Constantinople, and left this graffiti in the Hagia Sophia. They even took a Greek holiday to etch runes into the Piraeus Lion near Athens. Now, hold your tears, but the lost Viking cheesemakers might just be a legend based on an interpretation based on an Arabic text. But that brings up a bigger linguistic question. Why do we run to Arabic and Latin for our Viking history? Did the Norse not know how to write? Meet the runes! This is the Elder Futhark. It's the oldest form of the runes, and it works like a full-on alphabet. It's not the ABCs, though. It's a Futhark. F-U-T-H-A-R-K. These straight-line letters, perfect for wood and stone, are hundreds of years older than the Vikings, though. It's hard to say where they come from. They look italic, but what kind of italic? Latin? Some other old Italic alphabet? But they evolved to write early Germanic languages, like Proto-Norse. Artifacts in the Elder Futhark are rare, mostly Scandinavian and all short, often very short. This comb is our oldest. It says Haria. That doesn't mean hair. <laughs> that would be funny, but it's probably a personal name. Ah, personal names. Time after time, these things say, this is my name and I made this. Like on these Danish golden horns from the 5th century. I, Hlewagastis Holtiaj, made this horn. But these runes weren't all about passing information. Runes offered protection. Magic words like Tiwaj, the god Chu in Tuesday, Laukaj for garlic, and all over the place, Alu, ale. Oh, and in this ale, you can see how the writing direction wasn't even always left to write. So runes had power. Or in the words of this runestone, Master of runes, I hide here runes of power, forever plagued by evil deeds and doomed to insidious death whoever breaks this. I like it. Those still aren't Viking runes. These are Viking runes. The Futhark took this shape just a bit before the sacking and pillaging at the beginning of our story. This is called the Younger Futhark, and it was a big change. Spot the difference? At a time when Latin was busy adding letters, the Norse were actually going backwards in a way, cutting letters out. They got rid of p, d, and g, even though they were still pronouncing them. Now b, t, and k had to do double duty. This happened with a number of letters, consonants and vowels. By the way, these magical runes, they all have fancy Germanic names. The younger Futhark was short on letters, but not on inscriptions. Today, we only have hundreds of inscriptions in the Elder Futhark, compared to thousands upon thousands in the Younger Futhark, mostly rune stones honoring dead men. The language of these imposing stones is Old Norse, 
and it's already very different from that proto-Norse from earlier. Younger Futhark rune stones give us a second look at those ominous seafaring raiders so despised and feared by the book and ink crowd. Gunni raised this stone in memory of Rogni, his good son. He died on the western route. Ragnvaldr had the runes carved. He was in Greece. He was commander of the retinue. Inga raised this stone in memory of Olafr. He plowed his stern to the east and met his end in Italy. Vefaster had this stone raised up in memory of Gudmundr, his brother. He died in the Abbasid Caliphate. May God help his spirit. Then, the end of the Viking Age. Pagan Scandinavia was Christianized. But were they done with runes? Not right away. When King Harald Bluetooth told the world how he converted the Danes, he used a rune stone. Sweden has the greatest concentration of rune stones, and many of them are late and explicitly Christian. But then watch out, there's still Thor's hammer. The Latin alphabet took over in the 1100s when the Norse fully joined the Book and Ink Club and wrote down their Eddas and sagas. But interest in the runes lingered. They made a medieval comeback in Codex Runicus for writing Nordic laws. They even survived in a pocket of Sweden as the Dalekarlian runes into the 1800s. The old runes were terse. They were short on words, but rich with names. They meant kinship, protection, and remembrance to a people that didn't see writing as the mellifluous prose of Arabic and Latin. Well, at least to the ones that didn't convert to a book and eat culture and start making cheese. But the Norse weren't the only rune masters around in the first millennium. Come watch The Endless Knot to explore the etymological twists and turns taken by runes, and the word rune itself in the history of English. Stick around and subscribe for language.